Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Welcome back for come to the Transform track. Um, last, but definitely not the least, we have uh, Nirmal Mehta from Booz Allen Hamilton. He's a chief technologist at the Strategic Innovation Group there. And he will be talking to us about bringing empathy to IT. It's a topic that rarely comes up. So I'm kind of excited. And I hope you guys are as well. The floor is yours. Thanks. Hi, everybody. You made it. It's the last session. I'm keeping you from Cool Hacks. Please go to Cool Hacks, by the way. That's like the best stuff. They always save it all at the end. It's after this. Um, you've survived, right? Are you, are you guys all having a good time? Come on, let me hear you guys. Yeah, there we go. All right. <laughs> OK, so uh, who's in an IT organization that you think is kind of screwed up? <laughs> oh, wow. OK, so this is the talk for you guys. Good for you all. Um, I'm Nirmal Mehta. I'm a chief technologist at Booz Allen. Thank you for the intro. Uh, you can find me on Normal Faults. Uh, I've done this talk a couple different places. This is the fifth time I've done it. Um, and it's kind of odd, because it doesn't seem like it should fit at DockerCon. And we'll get to that. Uh, we'll get to why it all, it all tied back together. It'll tie back to Docker. But it's a, kind of, it's a, different, it's a different topic. Um, so I've been doing government IT. Uh, so Booz Allen's a large government contract in the US. I've been doing government IT for 10 years. I'm a Docker captain. I forgot all my captain gear. I, I apologize. Uh, so you, you feel free to ask me any question about Docker, uh, Swarm, Kubernetes, a little bit. Um, and you know, if you're new to it, I'm always open to that. I can connect you with other folks in the area. Uh, you can find me at Normal Faults. I love DevOps. It's like what I do and what I talk about. And I beg you to teach me something new. I'm always open for a nice discussion and to learn something. You all are knowledgeable about something in the world. Tell me about it. And it's broad. That's a broad statement. Follow my dogs on Instagram. Uh, they're really cute and awesome. So what's this talk about? Technology is easy. That's what this like whole entire other part of this conference is about, making technology easy. But culture is hard. People are hard. You know. We kind of skirt around that issue. We don't really want to talk about it. This is going to be talking about all the people stuff. Answers are hard, though. I don't have all the answers. This presentation will probably raise more questions than answers, and that's OK. Let it be a start of a discussion. Let it be the start of a conversation. Feel free to come, out, come up to me after this or get in touch. Tell me about your organization. Tell me about some of the problems you're having. Uh, I'd like to hear feedback. I, 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 uh, I've, I've seen a lot of things uh, across the government space, a lot of teams, a lot of organizations. And the conversations after these talks have illuminated a lot of other ideas. And it's also corrections. I've made mistakes in this presentation that have been corrected by folks. There's going to be some game theory, some behavioral economics in this. If you are a PhD in economics or math or game theory, please move out of the room. I'm going to murder it. You're going, to be, you're going to be like, this guy doesn't know anything. If you don't know any of that, you're going to learn something new. And it's all true. All right, moving on. <laughs> OK, so what happens in an IT organization? This is kind of where you're at right now. So I have this thing called Yoda and IT culture. So I love, uh, so who here has an Excel spreadsheet to keep track of IP addresses? All right, someone's, someone's telling the truth right here. Um, I love controlling IP address allocation spreadsheet. I'm not sure about this dev operations automation stuff. That's fear. That's the first reaction. When you go back to your IT organization and start talking about Docker, someone's going to be thinking this. I like my VMs. I like my 20-page you know, shell script Word doc to install stuff. Fear. What does fear lead to? Anger. Why do we have to change this process? I don't like it. I don't, I don't, I don't lose control. Right? I, want, I love my Excel spreadsheet. What does anger lead to? Hate. Has anyone seen Star Wars here? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? All right. So how are we supposed to keep track of all our IP addresses now when they can just pop up in containers? Come on. And what does hate lead to? No, you know, oh, one more step. Suffering. This is where we all are right now. If you're an IT organization and you're struggling, we're all suffering. 
Why does it take 100? Who's, who had an organization where it take a long time to allocate VMs? Yeah, because they treated them like, like physical hardware, right? Because you got to rack and stack a VM for some reason. Um, does anyone know what that picture on the right is? Anyone seen that? That is the Defense Department acquisition process. So if you want to acquire a paperclip or a tank, that's the process you go through. If you want to acquire a virtual machine, that's the process you go through. You can actually get a two-year associate's degree just in DOD acquisition process. It's incredible. So that's the world I live in. Um, it's probably not as bad as, I, I, or it's probably worse than the organizations that are represented in this room. Maybe not. Um, you know, but when we introduce new technologies, that doesn't necessarily change this. You know, why does it take 100 days to get a container? I've had clients where we present containers, they think they're VMs, they're not, um, but they still want to go through the same process. So this is the suffering that we're all kind of in right now. I see it all the time. If you're not in this suffering state, congratulations, you're in a successful organization. But there's still some tidbits in here that you might see. So that's the basis for this talk. It's about, getting, it's ad about identifying that you're in this, this spot and how to get out of this spot, okay? So um, I got permission, so the middle part of this talk is kind of carved out from John Willis's presentation about bad equilibrium. Um, he's a DevOps like guru. Uh, he just published a new DevOps book recently, uh, does all these podcasts, check that stuff out. I have all these slides and I've modified them with permission from him. He just asked me to pitch him a little bit there, so check him out. So game theory, we're gonna switch tracks a little bit, we'll come back around, all right? Game theory. Game theory is all about um, why, as an organization, we do things. And it's, it's a mathematical foundation for why we, dis why we make the decisions we do in an organization or when we're working with other groups of people or in an acquisition or any kind of game in a mathematical sense. And uh, part of that, there's two mathematicians that, and, and economics that kind of defined a lot of what the new, you know, the theories around game theory are. Um, the, the, the concept here is that we're gonna be talking about your IT organization being a, in a, what's called a bad equilibrium. So in a game, you know, both sides, dev and ops, that's what we're gonna get to talk about, dev and ops, there are strategies that the players can adopt, but there's no incentive to change that outcome. That's that suffering state you're in right now. And the theory that I'm gonna present is that that's what's called a bad equilibrium, that that exists. This is where, this is kind of like what, you know, what a DevOps kind of transformation looks like when you're on the onset. This is kind of the state where you're having a, you're struggling to change the organization. Switching tracks, just, just a side note, I gotta do some definitions and then we'll bring it all together. So does anyone know who this is? Yes, Pareto. He uh, came up with this thing called 80-20. Um, he also came up with this thing called the uh, uh, Pareto efficiency um, definition. And what that means is zero sum. It's a definition that defines zero sum. That means that in a game, or in an organization, the state of the allocation of resources, it's impossible to make one individual better without taking something from someone else. That's zero sum. That also means that there's something, you know, and that's kind of war games, right? Like one, one side loses, one side wins. There's also something, the opposite, which is Pareto inefficient state. And that means that if you're in a Pareto inefficient state, it's not zero sum. You can make someone more, you know, you, you can make someone better off without making someone else worse off. Hint, hint, that's probably where you are. You think you might be in a Pareto efficient state, but you're probably in a Pareto inefficient state, which is good. Does anyone know who this is? John Nash. Okay, are you like a PhD in economics? Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> um, so this is John Nash, he's a mathematician. He recently passed away um, in the last couple of years. He got a, uh, he had a movie uh, made about him, uh, you know, uh, Beautiful Mind. Um, he came up with this thing called the Nash Equilibrium, he got a Nobel Prize for it. That's a state in a game where, so in a game theory, when you have these two parties competing, 
Um, the optimal outcome of the game is where no one player can deviate from their chosen strategy after they know what the other cho side's choice is, okay? So that's the Nash equilibrium. It's kind of like where we've settled upon if you're in an organization. So if you think of like your IT department or your company as being a, like a large game, where you are today in that painful suffering state is your Nash equilibrium. And what that means is there's no incentive unless you explicitly like change the game, we'll get to that in a second. There's no incentive to change because everyone's already considered all the information, right? You're, it's not like there's some mystery there. That's your Nash equilibrium. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use some examples to show what that looks like. And one example is a uh, game show in the UK called Golden Balls. And uh, the game was kind of based off of this idea of game theory and a Nash equilibrium more specifically around something called the prisoner's dilemma, which is kind of where um, both sides have two choices and they, can, they kind of have to negotiate based on what, each side is, what they think each side is gonna choose, the optimal strategy for themselves. So we're gonna watch a, uh, watch a clip here of what that looks like as it plays out, just a normal game, game theory prisoner's dilemma. I know you're the last two people in the country I have to explain this to but you have two final golden balls. You each have a golden ball with the word split written inside. You each have a golden ball with the word steal written inside. You will make a conscious choice of choosing the split or the steel ball. If you both choose the split ball, you split today's jackpot of 100,150 pounds and you go home with 50,075 pounds of If one of you splits and one of you steals, whoever chooses the steel ball will go home with 100,150 pounds. And the person who chooses the split ball goes home with nothing. If you both choose the steel ball, you go home with nothing. Okay. Before I ask you to choose, I want you to look at your two golden balls and make sure you know which is the split ball and which is the steel ball. This is very important. Make sure you don't show each other. Before I ask you to choose, I think you have some talking to do to each other. Stephen, I just hope they weren't puppy dog tears and they were real oh. tears and you were genuinely going to split that one. I am going to split this. <laughs> Fifty thousand. I'm. Um, I'm just. Um, it's unbelievable. I'm very, very happy to go on with fifty thousand. If I stole off you, every single person there would run over you and lynch me. There was no way I could. I mean, everyone who knew me would just be disgusted if I stole. When when people watch this, they're not going to believe it. Please. I can look you not. in the Sarah. I can look you straight in the eye and tell you I am going to split. I swear down to you, I am going to split. Okay, this is serious money. It is. Sarah, Steve, choose either the split or the steel ball now. Hold it up. We're going on with 50 grand each, I promise you that. Split or steel? Oh! Oh! Woo! Man, all right. That was intense. So what, what happened there? So this is, this is kind of a graph of what, what's going on in the minds of those two contestants. We got Steve and Sarah, and they have two options, split or steel, right? And so, um, the game designers are not dumb. They designed this game, and it's based off the prisoner's dilemma, to have the Nash equilibrium be that they don't want to pay out the $100,000, 100,000 pounds. That's what they want. Because they know that, you know, each player can't really trust each other, so they're going to assume, you know, they're going to try to play, play off each other. The best, the, the highest incentive uh, move for them is to steal, for both of them to steal. 
And that's what, they're kind of count that's what the game designers are counting on. So the Nash equilibrium in this case is down here in the bottom right. Does that kind of make sense? That's where the, the people that run the game, they don't want to pay out. So what happens here is uh, those options, you know, they both go to steal, and Sarah basically just like, you know, used her wily ways to convince Steve that she was going to split, but we saw what happened. So th this is kind of what happens in a dysfunctional IT organization, right? Like everyone's kind of playing off each other. There's all these responsibilities and decisions, but your Nash equilibrium is that suffering state. That's that place where it's like, you know, you, no one can figure out, like everyone knows all the pieces of information, everyone playing this game, but we're all suffering, you know? No, no, no one's getting the payout. What I'm arguing in this is that a Pareto inefficient Nash equilibrium is called what, what that state is called. The nice thing though is that it's Pareto inefficient. That means that the, there's, the, your organization doesn't have to suffer. No one has to lose anything, but the problem is there's no incentive to change right now. And the only way to change is to change the game. So if you're stuck in this game, and you're in a Pareto inefficient Nash equilibrium, which is what your IT organization is now, the only way is to change the game. And my argument in the rest of this talk is that empathy and DevOps and all these other things that we kind of skirt around and using behavioral economics is a way to change the game. So let's look at what, um, a, what, what a changing of the game looks like. So, this Pareto inefficient Nash equilibrium state gives you the permission to go to your management and say, hey, I saw this cool talk at DockerCon, it wasn't about containers, but I think IRT and organization is in a Pareto inefficient Nash equilibrium, and they're gonna, first of all, they should give you a raise because you just blurted out like four awesome words. And then after that, they're gonna be like, what are you talking about? And you're gonna be like, well, it's not a zero sum game, but we need to change the game, we're all suffering here, okay? So let's look at what, what it looks like when the game changes and when someone knows that they're in this state and they know that it's not zero sum even though everyone else thinks it's zero sum and what changing the game looks like, all right? Okay. It's the easiest choice but the most difficult one. What I want you to do is to spend half a minute talking to each other about what you both should do. Nick, Abraham. Abraham, I want you to um, trust me. 100% I'm going to pick the steel ball. Sorry, you're going to... I'm going to choose the steel ball. You're going to take... I want you to do split, and I promise you that I will split the money with you. Well, after you took steel? Yeah. You're going to take steel? Yeah. I'm going to take split? Yeah. So you take the money... And I will split it with you. After the show? Yeah. <laughs> I promise you I'll do that. If, if if you do steal, we both walk away with nothing. I'm telling you 100% no, I'm going to do it. I appreciate that. Right, I'll give you another alternative. <sighs> Why don't we just both pick split? I'm not going to pick split. I'm going to steal, Abraham. Honestly, 100% I'm going to steal. It's in your nature to steal. No, I, I'm honest, and I'm going to tell you're you... You're honest. I am. That's why I'm telling you I'm going to steal. If you do split, then I will I split the money. I can't see myself doing that. Eh? OK, well, I'm going to steal, so I'm going to leave with nothing. Where's your brains coming from? <laughs> if I gave you my word, now let me, let me tell you what my word means. Okay. My father once said to me, a man who doesn't keep his word is not a man. He's not worth nothing. Not worth a, not worth a dollar. I agree. So, even how I'm going to steal. So you've got the choice. You either steal and we both walk away with nothing. Because you know, I've told you my intention, and I've told you that I will split the money with you, Abraham. And I do now have to push you for a decision. It's a tough one. We've lost it. We've lost everything. Okay. We've lost then. We're walking away with no money because you're an idiot. No, that's you're not right. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. That's what you are. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. That's what you are. Right, I'll tell you what. I'm going to go with you. Okay. I'm going to go with you. I promise you, you I'll split it. You cannot change your balls now. Split or steal? Yes! Congratulations, you have both split. So this is what, so Nick was brilliant. He obviously 
probably had a PhD in economics, but um, he knew that this was a game theory, prisoner's dilemma scenario. Actually, what he did, like changing the rules, like basically saying that he was gonna promise to split after the game, they couldn't change the game anymore, so they actually canceled the show because he basically broke the game. Um, <laughs> And he figured it out. So what he did was he, he removed Ibrahim's decision ability and, ch and moved the Nash equilibrium from where it was before, right, where the game designers want to not pay out, to a, to a spot where, oop, where so, so the promise to split after the show basically like removes Ibrahim's decision ability, right? Because he, he, he's hearing that um, Nick is going to steal, and so he has one. He has one uh, choice to steal himself because maybe he thinks Nick's is. But that's like the worst decision to make. The other decision is to use to do split. He's basically forced to do split. That's the only rational kind of decision after you know that Nick is going to steal. So Nick was brilliant. He basically forced Ibrahim th to make the most rational choice and the best incentive for himself. And he moved the Nash equilibrium essentially to the top left quarter. And that became the new Nash equilibrium of Nick's golden balls game, right? The one that, where he can split outside the show. That's what changing the game means. And that's what you have to do in your IT organization. If, you're keeping, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you're, that organizational scar tissue that you've built up, that is what's keeping your organization from changing because that's how, you're, you're playing the same game. You're not gonna get out of that Nash equilibrium. Changing the game, changing your culture, introducing these new concepts, and, and really understanding all the aspects of your IT organization and, and understanding that you have to step back and really do a cultural shift is how you change the game. So this, was, this is kind of what it looks like in your IT organization. Your Nash equilibrium is right here, right? So ops and devs, right? Devs and ops. Not my problem, not my problem. That's where your Nash equilibrium is, right? And we wanted to go back to where everyone's got shared responsibility. If you think about DevOps and what these successful organizations are doing, like Netflix, where the developers have the pagers, right, when things break, that's what they're doing. They're, they're forcing the game to change. They're forcing the national equilibrium of that state of the organization to, to incentivize the proper behavior or better behavior. So if, if you've got this not my problem attitude, and everyone's got that not my problem attitude, you're in, you're in a suffering state. And that, that builds over time. It's called organizational scar tissue by Adrian. Um, it's a, that's a great term. You know? We've always done it that way. I don't need to change. I like my IP address allocation sheet. A changed organization is where both sides have responsibility. And that's what we're kind of, and how do you foster that? You foster that by becoming a learning organization. If you're not building a learning organization, if you're not building an empathetic organization, if you're not building an organization where everyone's kind of on the same page, you'll be losing to someone who is doing that right now and has got it under control. So how can we help foster DevOps culture? Use the force, right? What's the force? Empathy and some behavioral economics. So I'm gonna go through some examples of things that you can do in your IT organization to start that transformation. And it comes from some things out of the cognitive biases and behavioral economics world. So one thing is called group selection bias. So if we were all to like mingle together, um, I mean, we did this all at the party last night, you probably just stayed with your coworkers, first of all, and then you know, all the captains only hung out. And the, you know, so we all just, you know, like just naturally collect with like, like groups or more comfortable groups. And that actually goes against what you need in IT organization. So if you, if you had your like a, I don't know, like a all hands meeting with your whole entire IT department, the security folks would start hanging out together, the networking folks would hang out, the storage folks, they wouldn't intermingle. And I bet you in your organization you have a silo for each of those groups, right? Or maybe you had silos, you know, a networking team, a security team, a storage team, a VM team, a container team maybe, I don't know a DevOps team, I don't even know what that means. Um, sorry if you're in a DevOps team. Um, so to counteract that, make teams, now, and, I, and I, I've gotten some feedback on this that it's a little tricky, you kinda have to do a little bit of cross matrixing and stuff, but try to do teams where you have one of each group of folks in your organization 
and share that responsibility. You know, everyone hates on the security team, but they're probably at the end of this process and have no visibility on what's going, what's coming down the pipe. If they're shared, you know, if they're embedded in your actual development team or feature team or product team early on, that conversation changes. Make sense? Does it make sense? Yeah? All right. Let me know if, that, if you tried that and it didn't work, or if you have tried it and it's working, or whatever. I would love to hear some feedback on that. Incentives. So we had a, I had a project where we were trying to introduce infrastructure as code, right? Which is like a very basic first step in our technology, automation, and all that. And it, it helps the organization. But we also had change control boards. Now, most places, I hated change control boards. It's just like a rough thing to do to go through. Um, who here has change control boards that they have to go through? Yeah. So what we actually did was we, we used the change control board as an incentive. So what we told organizations, I don't know how we got permission to do this, but we told organizations that if they did their stuff in infrastructure as code, they didn't have to go through change control board. But if they didn't do infrastructure as code, then they had to go through a two-week change control board. Magically, <laughs> Everyone started writing chef scripts and Ansible scripts and Docker files for their stuff. And that's, so think about the incentives in your organization. Are there some things that you don't like? Can you use those actually to incentivize the behavior that you want, to, uh, to get that automation, to get buy-in from those organizations? Create positive incentive paths, and that's another way to move that Nash equilibrium. Empowering change. How many here um, are are beholden to security controls, but don't have access to Nexus and like the scanning until all the way at the end of the process. Is anyone, yeah, is anyone tracking what I'm saying? So, so a lot of IT organizations, the security stuff is kind of at the end, and they do scans at the end. And the problem is the developers don't even have access to that. That doesn't make any sense. There's no way for the developers to know what they're getting graded upon until the very end, right? And then all of a sudden, it's like they get this thing that says they can't use this you know, library anymore or you know, this Docker image or something like that. You gotta move all that stuff to the left. You gotta empower the developers to understand the game that they're playing, right? Which is this compliance and security game. Otherwise, amplifications of power differences start to create a negative cycle. So if you don't empower change in an organization, if you don't empower everyone to be able to make those changes and to pull that and on cord, um, you get into what's called a negative innovation cycle. So if you think about an organization, you have you know, regulation, you know, your compliance regulation at the top in a loop, and then what do you do when you have regulation? You try to find a loophole, right? Like find some library that, you know, or do something that's kind of a little shady. That leads to a scandal when it gets hacked, right? And that leads to more regulation, right? And, it, and, and more enforcement of that. And that's a negative cycle. And the only way to break that, so every time that goes through, you lose people, because some people are just like, I'm out. I'm not going through that again. And you also lose innovation. You lose the ability to move forward. Innovation, injecting innovation right before that loophole stage is how you break that cycle. And doing that through empowering, uh, empowering your folks to, to speak up. And so instead of hiding that they're like gonna sneak around your regulations and try shady stuff, empower them to make those changes. Does that make sense? How can we help foster empathy in organization? So why, so all of us have, we're in IT, we have strong opinions of the world. I would say I beg of you, to, it's okay to have strong opinions. Kubernetes, Swarm, Docker, Red Hat, uh, Microsoft, you know, Windows, Linux, it's fine. But don't hold on to them too tight. Our world is moving so fast, and I know you've done it better back in the old days. Just hold on, there's, there's good stuff that's coming, and it's always a little bit different each time. I, the, the reason I started this talk was I got asked a question on a podcast about a moment I regretted in, in, in my job as a manager or in an IT organization, and what happened was I recalled an event where a junior developer came up to me and was asked me what I thought was a stupid question. And it was really dumb for me to think that, but at the time I, was just, I just ignored him. And what I found out later was that it took him so long to like build up the courage to even approach me. 
And then on top of that, he had spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. And he just couldn't figure it out. And in like two seconds, I basically dismissed like a week's worth of like building up of him trying to like get the courage and trying to figure it out and doing all this stuff. And because I had a strong opinion about that, I like completely dismissed what he brought up. I turned out I was completely wrong. I didn't even remember him bringing it up. But I remember that moment, and I remember it when I got asked that question, I super regretted doing that. You know, it, he probably spent a lot of time just trying to figure it out, couldn't do it. And I was, I was a dick, I was an asshole, right? And th I shouldn't have done that. I should have had those strong opinions because I have experience, but I should have loosely held them and been open to what he was ta talking to me about and the solutions he was providing. I think, we, I hope we don't all do that, but I know that we've all been in those kind of positions where we feel like, you know, we ignore things that are happening just because it's kind of, it's overwhelming. Let's take a step back, explain where, why you have a strong opinion about that and be, be open to new things. And, and that's how you also change the Nash equilibrium. If you're closed-minded and you have that organizational scar tissue, you're never gonna go anywhere. Active listening. I have a longer f uh, version of this talk where we do an active listening ex exercise. Pat yourselves on the back that you don't have to do it. So what that means is actually under, you know, taking the time to, to listen to the other folks and not just thinking about what your response is gonna be while the other person is talking. Very hard to do in practice. There's a lot of YouTube videos around there how to become a better active listener. I'd recommend checking those out. Avoid assumptions. Uh, you know, there's the classic saying, I, I don't know if I can cuss anymore, probably hit my limit, but um, you know, avoid assumptions, it gets you somewhere bad. When you, when you do assumptions, especially these days where, you know, an assumption about Kubernetes like last week is probably changed by this week, right? And so if someone brings up something new, they might be actually right, but you just have old information. Incentivize teaching and learning in your organization. This is very difficult to do. It's not a technology problem. We have so many ways of capturing knowledge. It's about Culturally, and this is, this is kind of something you have to argue to your management. If you are a manager, if you're a C-level in this room, this is where the gold is. If you can make a learning organization and a teaching organization, you will be steadfast and strong and resilient and anti-fragile against your competition and against the, the you know, IT industry as a whole. What that means, though, is that you have to incentivize people sharing knowledge and not building their little kingdoms. And, and that's, that's the kind of tricky, tricky piece there. What's gonna happen if you have a lot of little kingdoms in your, in your IT organization is DevOps and containers and all serverless, all that is gonna just steamroll right through. If you're a learning organization and you, make, you, you have a problem, uh, I, I think there was a, the, a group that did a live Google Hangout. Um, what company was that? They did like a post-mortem. Uh, they were debugging it, I forgot what it was, but there was this uh, IT organization that, I think it was uh, GitLab, right? GitLab did like a, a public Google Hangout while they were doing a post-mortem and debugging a, a, a site-wide failure. That is an organization that I would trust to be a learning organization, because they are literally teaching every, anyone who wants to learn. And then they got feedback from like random people on the internet to help them out. That's the kind of organization you want to try to achieve. Obviously, if you have secrets and all that kind of stuff, maybe not to the, like, the wider public, but you know, maybe open it up to larger groups of people in your organization. And doing postmortems and blameless postmortems are a good step. Netflix just went down for the first time in a long time, and I cannot wait to read the postmortem from there. I bet I'm going to learn a lot from that. Turn failure into understanding. That's what I was just talking about. And then recognize the stress levels of others. So John Willis. He, uh, he and I, we talk a lot about stress, about burnout. He had a friend of his uh, that was a mentee, and uh, that gentleman committed suicide because he just got so burned out in his IT job. And that impacted John really, really strongly. He actually wrote a, a blog post about burnout in general in IT organizations in our industry, and that it's a real problem. Be careful about the, you know, understand, if you're a manager, understand that folks are going through these waves. They might be able to sustain it for a long time, but they're probably hiding a lot of suffering. Be careful about pushing people too hard. We're, we're really, we're, we're in a magical place, you know? We are very, very lucky in this room. 
Don't ruin it. There's no need for that suffering. There really isn't, you know? At the end of the day, improving ads is not like the end of the world. Uh, but, you know, if you're working on healthcare and other stuff, I understand. But you get what I mean, right? Like, there's, there's no need for that. Um, check out those YouTube videos. Understand, recognize burnout waves. If you feel like your IT organization isn't doing the right job, be that person in your organization that brings it up. You're going to be able to save a person's life, probably. There's also a great podcast um, called Happiness at Work by Lorinda Brandon. I haven't met her yet. I hope to meet her somewhere in a conference sometime. If you know her, let me know. I'd love to get in touch. Um, she came up with a list of things that really help drive happiness in an organization and in, in your work. Take these to heart. They're great. I'm not going to read them all, but uh, you can take a picture of this. Slides will be available after the, after the conference. Uh, the podcast is amazing. It really helped me center who I was, especially after that question I got about regret and about some self-reflection. I really took these to heart, and I try to drive that through all the work I do and, and, and preaching it from here. Be a champion for empathy in your organization. You're here now. You've been listening to this. You are now got the torch. You have all these things that you can use now in your organization. You have evidence now that you are suffering in an IT organization. You can explain with game theory that you have to change the game. You have to do that change. And you have some, you have some tools now, some ways of incentivizing, some things that you, you can use to manipulate the psychology of your IT uh, co comrades and colleagues. But you also now have an understanding of what it means to be in IT and what it means to be an active listener and an active learner. Obtain, if, you're, if you are in a situation where you have a conflict, you really need to take some time to understand the other side. It's probably not as clear. They probably have fear that drives wrong assumptions, and that's what's, what's causing the conflict, and that's probably what's causing the, the miscommunication. Obtain the full context of the situation and really get to the root of the fear. Uh, an example of this, when I did this talk in, uh, in Chicago, someone came up to me, and uh, one half of their IT organization was against getting laptops. The other half of the IT organization was like, I don't understand why you are against getting laptops when you have workstations. It's not a big deal. And what they found out, and, I, and we were talking, and he was like, he explained the situation. I was like, this is, kind of sounds bizarre, but I have a, a feeling that if you were assigned a laptop, maybe the fear is that you have to do work when you go home. And if you can assuage that fear, if you can say, if you can say, you know, just because you have a laptop doesn't mean you have to do work at home, you'll probably get a better adoption rate and, and understand that communication. He's like, that's true because he had heard anecdotally that was kind of the case. It's like simple stuff, right? I mean, it's weird, but that's, we're all humans. It's hard. We have all these innate fears. We have all these things that, and assumptions that we're making and, and games that we're playing in our heads. Kind of got to step back and really understand what's going on. And if you see someone else that's having the same challenge, approach them, explain that you're there to help them through whatever conflicts, and make it a safe area to describe those fears and, and grow together. Also, the, another way to do it is to become an active member in a community. So uh, Steve uh, Singh yesterday talked about the importance of community. Uh, I'm a Docker captain. I'm very active in, in our DevOps community. It doesn't mean just speaking. It just means being there, being a representation of something new, being a mentor. Uh, I, I have folks that come up to me and say, I just need some advice. I wanna, want just some, a cup of coffee and talk about where I am in my career or you know, what's, what's happening, just need to vent. Be there to listen, just be an active listener. It will help you avoid those same problems in your IT organization, even if it's from folks that are not even in your, in your company. Speak up, help out, and learn together. OK, so I thought this was a Docker talk. <laughs> We're at DockerCon, not like DevOpsCon. Um, I thought this was a DockerCon, a, a Docker talk. So my argument is Docker is a tool to foster empathy in your organization. Uh, th this kind of dawned on me, and we talked about it in the Captain Slack channel. And someone was like, Docker files are kind of like empathy as code. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, because you have the devs and the ops communicating together through this shared document. So I was like, oh, empathy as code. That's like brilliant. It ties it all together. I can get Docker to actually take my talk. 
Um, but it's kind of true, though. It, when you're making a Docker file or a Compose file or a Cube file or a Pod file or whatever, Chef script, Ansible script, Shell script, Word document, that's a, that's a point of communication, of debate, of, of organization, of, of that change happening. You have to figure that out. Otherwise, the Docker file doesn't run. You have to figure out what ports to run, what packages to use, what images to use, what libraries to have, what languages to use, what database connections to have, how to, how to keep secrets. You're forced to make those decisions and not skirt the rules. And that forcing of, the, of that communication forces the empathy. You have to other, I mean, if, if you don't communicate with the operations team, your Docker file is not going to run. And likewise, if the operations team doesn't look, talk to the, to the dev, the Docker file is not going to work. It's not going to output the right thing. The Docker file or whatever infrastructure's code element can be the place where you can actually kind of sneak a little bit of empathy into your organization. It's kind of weird. And move the responsibility from not my problem, right? That's op Oop, excuse me. That's ops problem. You know, back, so I've been in organizations where they literally wrote a Word document, like a 15-page Word document, threw it over the fence, and that's how you ran software, right? <laughs> now it should be you work together on a Docker file. No, there's no fences anymore. We're in a Zen, no fence world. And then you run your software together with responsibility. Um, I'm going to end on... Uh, a concept called True North. Uh, a lot of DevOps talks talk about this. A lot of books talk about this. Um, True North is a, is a concept in an organization where it's kind of like this third, third party entity or this, this thing that's not devs, not ops, not IT. It's, a, it's an idea that everyone is striving for. At Alaska Airlines, it was a 60, it was a 20 minute turnaround at the gate or 60, 60 second clean uh, gate opening. And what they found out is if everyone aims at that, at that goal, they could buy three new airplanes every year with the, with the savings they got. Um, they, so they made that their true north. And it could be a temporary thing. So what, I'm, my, what I argue to you today is when you go back to your IT organization, for a little bit of time, doesn't have to be every, all, the whole entire time, make empathy in your organization the true north, the thing that everyone's aiming for. And you can truly get out of that Nash equilibrium. The core of DevOps is empathy. It's in the name. It's DevOps. It's not devs clobber ops. It's not just devs, right? Which, uh, unfortunately, it's kind of turning out to be. But DevOps, the core is empathy, if you really, really, if you really get down to it. And that's it.